So many are frustrated and struggling with their health, partly because the system is totally broken. So much of it is corrupt. We've seen a lot of that over the past few years. If you're one of those strugglers, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you pay attention tonight to part two of this special series of how to dig your health out of the infinite hole of our modern world. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. Welcome to Dr. Osborne's zone. Now I've been spending a lot of time talking about health advice gone wrong, bad public health policy, and other topics similar to that. And today I wanna to make things very, very coherent for you. These are all protective mechanisms that your immune system has, the umbrella, if you will, that protects you and allows you to interact with the environment without dying. And then above that, you've got the rain clouds of you know, microorganisms, parasites, malignant cells, allergens, toxins, etc., that are trying to penetrate through that immune system. So it's this, it should be this nice balance. If your immune system's functioning well, it should be able to kind of head off that rainstorm, so to speak, and keep you protected and dry. But if your immune system is compromised, then those things can penetrate through and then cre start creating their problems. We know, you know, with, with nutrition is, so, is such an important part of your immune system, and that's why I'm spending this time talking about it. If you look at this quote, this has come out of uh, the textbook of medical physiology. The, the, this is the textbook that most medical schools use um, when teaching doctors physiology. Again, the quote here, each of the 100 trillion cells in the human being is a living structure that can survive indefinitely and in most instances can even reproduce itself provided its surrounding fluids contain appropriate nutrients. Indefinitely, keyword indefinitely, these are cells in a petri dish that we've had uh, living very, very long time provided we give appropriate nutrients to those cells. And this is true of the cells in your body. They need nutrients to survive and to replicate. And this is very, very critical that you understand nutrition is the most important choice you can make on a daily basis for your health. And biochemistry is nutrition. Part of what we're exposed to are chemicals, right? And some of these chemicals are in our food. Um, I want to quote here uh, one of the past administrators um, of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, he said, of all man's interventions in the natural order, none is accelerating quite so alarmingly as the creation of chemical compounds. There's, however, a price to pay for an industrial society that has come solely or come to rely so heavily on chemicals. Almost 35,000 of those used in the U.S. are classified by the EPA as being either definitely or potentially hazardous to human health. You know, so, you know, you've got some, I've got some pictures down here, you know, the chemicals and, you know, the coating and pans and pots, the chemicals that are used in medicines, the, you know, the chemicals that, you know, are put into the children's foods, you know, and then dolled up with cartoon characters in, in really frilly colors, you know, to manipulate them into thinking they're okay. You know, paints, um, things that we produce our homes with, you know, the fabrics and the, and the, and the petrochemicals that we create, plastics and um, gasoline and fuel additives and other things that we're exposed to, household cleaners that we're exposed to, vast, again, 35,000 chemicals classified as dangerous or hazardous by the EPA that we use on a regular basis. Um, that's a lot of chemical exposure. And then if you look at food additives, um, you know, we have a, a massive list of food additives, over 3,000 different chemicals that are used as food additives that are allowed in the U.S. Many of those that are allowed here in the U.S. are not allowed in Europe or not allowed in other parts of the world, but they are allowed here. And, um, you know, a lot of those, the safety of those were never studied. They were just based on the fact that they were around long enough so that we knew that they wouldn't poison somebody tomorrow, right? So, you know, if you, you, know, you eat or are exposed to one of these chemicals, you're not necessarily gonna fall dead tomorrow. But a lot of the chemical exposures that we get are accumulative, meaning that they accumulate over time and that's where the damage sets in. 
That's why it's so hard to prove these things legally in court battles and court cases and actually um, make people responsible for the production of these chemicals liable for the damage these things are doing because um, it's, it's multifactorial, it's complex. It's not just one chemical, it's multitudes of chemicals. So I call it fruit, um, not food. Right, Franken food, if you will, aside from the possibility of reacting to real food, so there, there are people that actually have true food allergies, the FDA has approved approximately 3,000 food additives, preservatives, and colorings. The average person ingests about 150 pounds of additives every year. Think of that, you know, if you, if you weigh 150, you're eating your body weight in chemicals in food additives each year. Um, many commonly eaten foods are genetically modified or contain genetically modified ingredients. So, you know, this is one of the conundrums that we're in. It's why we see, in, you know, one of the reasons why we see mass increases in autoimmune disease. You look at this cover from Newsweek, this was, you know, this is not a new cover, but so this is a problem we go back 15 years ago and say they were calling it a problem then, and it's only escalated now today, but you can see your kids and the growing food allergy threat. Why are kids becoming more and more allergic? Well, are they becoming allergic to the food or are they becoming allergic to the components that we use to process the food or the way that we process the food? Or are they reacting poorly because today um, children, you know, children today under the age of, of two are given more than 20 types of injections before the age of two, right? And there's never been a single study that's looked at kids that have been vaccined versus ones that have not been um, in as far as the outcomes, except for there was a really good book written by a doctor uh, named Paul Thomas. You should check it out. It's called The Vaccine Friendly Plan, um, where he actually did that research. He did that research in his private practice and found that, that um, kids that didn't get stuck had much more robust health and less autoimmune disease. Now, I'm not saying that that's the only trigger. It's just one of many. I think the food chemicals, you combine those with a lot of these jabs, um, and you, you again, you can create a storm of problems. You look at some of these chemicals that uh, kids are exposed to on a daily basis when they go to school, have school lunch, or parents pack them a lunch, right? You've got tartrazine and sunset yellow and carnosine and brilliant blue and sunset. Uh, yellow FCF and Allura Red and um, sodium propionate and BHT and BHQ and sodium benzenate. Like, these are all chemical preservatives that either preserve the food uh, from rotting um, so that it doesn't go bad or they add color or flavor or texture or palatability to the food uh, and they're not good for you. Newsflash, if you're eating these things, you should really reevaluate re um, your diet. There's toxins in food. We've also got herbicides, pesticides, steroids, hormones, antibiotics, and excitotoxins that are found in food. You see here it takes approximately five to eight pounds of chemically sprayed grain to produce a pound of beef. Therefore, you will ingest considerably more cancer-causing chemicals from meat than from fruit and vegetables. And I would, I would say this is one of the arguments against meat that people have, right, is that you get exposure to a lot more chemicals. But I would argue the opposite is true if you're eating real meat. Like you shouldn't be eating feedlot beef. You shouldn't be eating the beef that's being locked into a cell and fed chemically loaded grains. You should be eating grass fed, grass finished, right? There are no health risks in that regard um, because those cows are not being fed chemicals and, and pesticides and fertilizers. Those cows are eating natural grasses and grazing naturally, getting sunshine. And, uh, and, and living with their families out in the pasture in an open pasture until they're not. Um, on average, one glass of inorganic store-bought milk contains a residue of about 100 different antibiotics. Again, this is if you're eating you know, non-organic varieties. So this is the case for you know, buying real food, the case for supporting farmers that do it right, the case for supporting um, you know, businesses that do it right. You, you know, we've, we've taken well, we've taken a road where we want to pay as little as possible for the things that we buy, but we want the quality to remain high, and those two things don't match. You can't have quality without cost. You can't scale production without paying a penalty on how that, that scaling is going to impact the quality of the, of the goods on the outcome. And so part of the price that we're paying in industrialized cultures is we're paying the convenience tax and the convenience tax is taxing your health. Convenience tax is called autoimmune disease 
by the way, if you haven't figured that out yet. Pesticides. Three million tons of pesticides are used each year worldwide. More than 1,600 chemicals are used in their production. Most have not been tested for their toxic effect on humans. Exposure has been linked to autoimmunity, nervous system disorders, immune suppression, cancers, diabetes, reproductive damage, hormone problems, asthma, autism, and ADHD, migraine headaches, and developmental delays in kids. I mean, as parents, you know, shouldn't we be up in arms about these things? Shouldn't we be striving for organic? To me, um, why this is not why this is not common knowledge, and why people aren't aren't more aggressive with it? Because it's all about supply and demand. If you demand that that, that it's changed, then the change will come. You know, and, and but you have to speak with your pocketbook. If you're going to the grocery store and buying the basic stuff that's loaded with all these chemicals and and, and products, then um, you know, then you're supporting the problem and you're not part of the solution. Let's look next at air quality. So air quality, outdoor, in, our indoor environment is two to five times more toxic than our outdoor environment. This is, you know, according to the EPA. Now, in some cases, the air measurements indoors have been found to be a hundred times more polluted. That's a pretty big chunk. And this has to do with the way homes are being built today, the tighter windows, the tighter door seals, um, the chemicals that are being used, the formaldehyde-like substances that are preserving your wood and your, and your plastics, among other things, in your house, those chemical adhesives and sealants, um, those all outgas into your home, the paints, all that. And so, you know, that's why we're seeing indoor air quality deteriorate. Um, you know, the indoor air quality is super important, especially in today's world where people are sedentary because you're inside most of the day. If the quality of that air is poor, it's going to really take a toll on your health. So, um, again, with indoor air quality, you know, modern construction, chemical VOCs, that stands for volatile organic compounds, the, um, you know, the invention of HVAC systems, HVAC, um, basically that oftentimes is one of the reasons why houses become moldy. Uh, and so it can be a source of, of mold. Um, aging buildings, the older the building gets, of course, the greater the risk for the possible development of mold. Uh, we see this especially with schools. Actually, a couple of years ago, I had a patient a teacher with rheumatoid arthritis, and she was not responding to diet change. She was not getting better. But um, when summer break rolled around, she would go into remission. And then when the summer ended and she'd go back to the classroom, her rheumatological disease would kick back on. What we ended up finding was, was she was being mold poisoned, mycotoxin poisoned. And uh, so once we figured that out, we, we actually went to the school. We looked at uh, above her desk in her classroom and there was a couple of inches of black mold carpet growing above the ceiling tiles. And all the kids in her classroom were also sick all the time. Well, when we when we brought that to the school's attention, they didn't want to they didn't want to do anything. They wanted to ignore it. So we got a we got a Fox News reporter out there, and fortunately, it, it took a little time. But fortunately, we got the, actually got the school building torn down because it was it was poison. Uh, the infrastructure of the building was molded over because of improper care and improper maintenance. Uh, and this is a common problem in, in our infrastructure today as it ages. You know, we've all paid a, a convenience cost to cheap and affordable housing means that, you know, we have less than skilled laborers putting together a lot of our homes and they cut corners. And this can lead to, you know, to water penetration of homes that can lead to mold. You see in our mold morphology, 24% of the population has a genetic susceptibility to mold. So, um, it's not just mold allergy either. Um, you know, a lot of people think mold allergy, I'll get some sniffles, not a big deal. No, mold will kill you dead. The mycotoxins can inhibit your DNA and RNA from replicating, and they can age you at a very accelerated pace. They can trigger autoimmune diseases. They're known to cause different types of cancers. So you don't want to mess around um, with mold. And so you, it's important that you have your home checked and, and maintenanced well because it will, the mold will deteriorate the indoor air quality. And then we have EMF emissions like, we're, you know, 4G, now 5G. What's it going to be next? We know these things don't come without a cost. All the scientists and all the researchers that are experts in this field recognize that these emissions can contribute to cancers and other problems in health. So very, very important I hardwire at home. I, I, I make sure we're hardwired in and not, not necessarily relying on the Wi-Fi. 
Then you got outdoor air quality, right? So there's, you know, there's automobile exhaust and power plant emissions and gas vapor solvents, sulfur dioxide, outdoor allergens. So we're, we're exposed to things outdoors as well, especially those of you that live kind of in more industrialized areas. I used to live in Pasadena, Texas. Uh, those of you uh, are familiar with the movie Urban Cowboy with John Travolta, that, that movie was actually filmed uh, in Pasadena, Texas. That was my stomping yards as a kid. And, you know, I left, when, when I left Pasadena, it was because I had two sons of my own. And at the time I stepped out one morning on my porch and I could literally, I could taste the air. I could taste it, it was foul tasting. And I was like, I gotta get out of this place. And so we left and moved. I uh, never look back, but you know you can be in an industrialized area where you're exposed to more of these things, and so you have to make some decisions about how much exposure you want. You know, and sometimes you can't just pick up and move, but um, but sometimes you need to, and sometimes making that harder decision is the right thing to do for your health. Uh, but these outdoor air quality issues can increase the risk for asthma, again, which is an autoimmune disease, but also increase the risk for airway infections, lung cancer, and um, also there's a lot of heavy metal in a lot of these um, emissions that are produced. So we got cadmium and cesium and arsenic and lead and mercury, et cetera, that, um, that are being emitted by a lot of, again, the technologies and the conveniences that we use today can create some pretty nasty burdens on our health. Let's move into water quality. You know, if you don't filter your water, you should. And I'm not talking about the refrigerator filter that you exchange. That little carbon filter doesn't do a whole lot. I'm talking about, um, fil you know, really solid filtration like reverse osmosis that will pull a lot of these chemicals out. But if we look at tap water by itself, it contains contaminants including uh, microorganisms, heavy metals, agricultural runoff, that would be pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. Um, there's a study done a number of years ago in Houston where, you know, I, it's near where I live. Um, 42 prescription medications were found in the drinking tap water of the city. This is after the water was filtered by the city and cleaned by the city. 42. And uh, this report was, uh, was investigating major water supplies across the country. And so Houston had 42. Many of the other major cities also had high numbers of pharmaceuticals because people flush them down the toilet or they pee out on metabolized drugs and that gets into the water supply. And of course they reuse and recycle that water in many areas and so it ends back up into your water. That's why I use RO uh, as a filter. Then you got household chemicals, lawn chemicals, gasoline, dry cleaning solvents if you use dry cleaners and then drugs, uh, chlorine, fluoride, radioactive particles, lead, and other impurities. If you remember Flint, Michigan, a number of years ago, lead was making a lot of people very, very sick uh, in that town. Um, you know, many of these compounds are known carcinogens. So what's the key takeaway there? Filter your water. It's one of the simplest ways to protect yourself from all that nonsense. Let's focus a little on chlorine. Now, chlorine was, was important in cleaning of water and allowing for the reduction of infectious diseases in our history. Um, it was introduced in the early 1900s as a water cleaning agent. Um, you see 1908 into public drinking water in Chicago and was used to eliminate waterborne disease such as cholera and typhoid fever. And then widespread use began in 1914. So in the 70s, it was discovered that chlorine when added to water forms trihalomethanes um, by combining with certain naturally occurring organic matter and um, the National Cancer Institute estimates cancer risk for people who consume chlorinated water to be up to 93% higher than people who are not exposed to chlorinated water. So why do you filter your water? One of the reasons is to pull the chlorine out. The chlorine has to be added by the, the major water cleaning suppliers because you don't want to in, develop infectious disease. So chlorinating the water is not, let's just say it's, it's, it is an important component when you live in a city and you're, and you're recycling and sharing water. But you can pull that chlorine out of your water and you, and you should. Reverse osmosis um, does that carbon, granular activated carbon pulls chlorine out of the water. So, you know, again, pull that chlorine out before you drink it. Fluoride is another additive found in water. Um, you know, the myth of fluoride is, is you know, is even still today is being taught that fluoride is necessary to prevent cavities and that it's necessary for dental health. Um, you know, fluoride's a bad thing. 
uh, in my opinion, fluoride's a neurotoxin, first of all. Fluoride is a halide, so it in, what that means is it, is it blocks the uptake of iodine into your thyroid gland, fluoride does. So it, it, it's a trigger, a major trigger, contributing factor for thyroid disease. So is chlorine. Chlorine is another halide. So between the chlorine and the fluoride in the drinking water, it's, it's a disaster for your thyroid. And this is one of the reasons why we see thyroid disease massively increasing over the last many decades. The, you can see here the U.S. Department of Health plans to lower fluoride in the first or uh, fluoride in the drinking water for the first time in 50 years. Why are they coming out and doing it after, after that? Because the research is clear that fluoride is not, is not good. Show, studies show that fluoride is very damaging to the brain. Fluoride affects a section of the brain that regulates reactions to stressful circumstances, making human beings easier to control. Uh, the introduction of fluoride into the municipal water systems was first used by Hitler. Adolf Hitler used them in the concentration camps to, you know, in, a, in an attempt to help control prisoners. You know, think about that for a minute. You know, how many of you are buying fluoridated toothpaste or how many of you are going to the dentist and having your, your teeth soaked in fluoride, you know, every, every couple times every year? How many of you buy fluoridated water for your little babies? You know, they, all these things are marketed to you as they're, as they're supposedly beneficial for the teeth. Fluoride is not an essential nutrient required for the dentition or the healthy dentition or enamel structure of teeth. So keep that in mind as you're, um, as you're looking at, at that. Okay, let's look now at, um, at, at some historical elements around water. So if you look at this diagram, this, by the way, this, is, this diagram is produced by the CDC. So you can see here the 1900, if you look at this, and you look at the, the, the left-hand side of this graph, these are um, infectious disease rates in the U.S. in the 1900s. And so as you, go, as you go to the right on the graph from 1900 up to 2000, you can see the trend of infectious disease. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about how water played a role in reducing the spread of infectious disease. So you can see that um, in, in about, in, in the very early 1900s, about 1904 and on, 40 states uh, developed health departments because the drinking water pollution was such a problem in contributing to major disease outbreaks, infectious disease outbreaks. You know, at the time there were cesspools among, uh, you know, among other shared water supplies that were contaminated with feces and urine, human feces and urine. And so this is one of the reasons why infectious disease rankings were so high during that time, during that industrial age. You can see that by 1914, we had the first continuous municipal use of chlorine in the drinking water in the U.S. And look at infectious disease rates after that point. They really start and continue to decline. Um, and then you can see in the 1920s, the introduction of indoor plumbing. So now people are actually, um, you know, the plumbing is taking away feces and urine contaminated water and, and taking it to cleaning facilities with that indoor plumbing so people are not being exposed, the groundwater is not being exposed to those potential pathogens in, in human waste. And, and you can see infectious diseases continue to decline. Uh, and in 1941, you can see the first use of penicillin occurred there and infectious disease continues to decline. Now all these things happen um, largely as a part of the cleaner water supply and, and better cleaner access to water and cleaner access to food. Now, um, why am I showing you these graphs? This is where some of you are probably going to get pissed off at me, but um, I really don't care because, you know, if you get educated, then you'll be able to maybe change your life. But if we come back and look at this diagram, you see there where it says the, the after the first use of penicillin, the salt vaccine was introduced. This was um, the first vaccine, and, and then you can see the passage of the Vaccination Assistance Act. If you look at, at those two time plots, one being, um, one being in the 50s, the other being in the 60s, um, you don't really see infectious disease change much after that. We have, we have the, my point is the introduction of these vaccines. We've all been told, you've all been told this um, by the pediatricians, by the mainstream medical and by the media, that vaccines... Um, eradicated infectious disease in our human culture. 
but what I'm showing you, and this is directly from the CDC's website, so you know, don't argue with me, go argue with them, but what I'm showing you is that vaccines weren't even introduced until the 40s, uh, actually the, the, the 50s, and in any major capacity. And if you look at the rate of infectious disease, you can see that it was on such a decline before the first vaccine was ever introduced. So how could we credit vaccines for the, the mass reductions in infectious disease? And the answer is we can't. We have to look truly at history if we wanna understand it. You know, the history medical texts take the credit for the reduction in, um, in infectious disease through, you know, through the vaccine program. But I would, I would argue that it was really the engineers that figured out how to clean our water and how to, you know, clean our food and keep our food cleaner and pass laws and restrictions around selling rotten food or contaminated food and who, uh, and who engineered plumbing systems that would make our water supply safer and less prone to contamination. I would, I would argue those things are, are much more valuable from the public health perspective than any jab that anyone's ever received. Now, to, to add to this, let's just look at a few disease examples. You can see in these three diagrams, the one on the left, this is polio. And so we're looking at, at United States, but we're also looking at Great Britain. And you can see the percent decrease in disease um, in these diagrams. Again, we're gonna add some things on this time plot. So the percent decreases occurred after Food and Drug Cleanliness Act was passed, after water sanitization uh, act was passed and after indoor plumbing, we get the same trend. You know, polio was already vastly decreasing um, by the time the first vaccine was ever even introduced into the population. If you look at pertussis, same thing. We've got the same kind of downward trajectory before the first vaccines ever introduced. We already have a, an almost stabilization of of the incidence of that disease. And then you look at measles, which is the one everybody's screaming about right now, you can see the vast reduction in, in measles infections as a result of, again, what? Hygiene, right? Water sanitization, indoor plumbing, the Food and Drug, uh, Pure Food and Drug Act being introduced is basically, uh, these are all hygiene practices. Good hygiene leads to reduced risk of infection and good nutrition leads to increased ability to combat infection. And so those two things were happening simultaneously through the trajectory of the early 1900s before any, any jab was ever created or invented. And so most infectious disease was already, for all intents and purposes, from, from a major uh, damaging perspective to the population. They weren't major problems. Um, so why, why then did they get the credit um, because history was, was largely rewritten and most people aren't prone to remembering the history very well. If you look at it again, this diagram kind of puts it into perspective. You've got on the left hand side, you've got infectious disease and you, you follow that graph and you can see again dramatic reductions in the incidence of infectious disease. But what do you see on the right of this graph? As we've, as we've reduced infectious disease, we've caused an increased incidence of autoimmune disease. And that's, that's really what I want you to understand because life is, is about balance. Infectious diseases happen as a result of overcrowding. The same, if you have ever been on a farm, you know that animals will get disease when you overcrowd them. Animals will get disease when they're malnourished and they're not being fed properly. Well, humans are not different. We also, um, spread disease when we're overcrowded and we spread disease when we're being malnourished. And right now our food supply is extremely malnourishing. Um, and, and if you look again at these diagrams, what you see is an increased trajectory of an autoimmune development, partly as a result of too much hygiene. So I, you know, we, we can kind of go too far from the hygiene perspective. One of the theories of autoimmune disease is, is called the hygiene hypothesis, which is if you're overabundantly too clean, then you don't give your immune system enough time to train to, um, to appropriately respond so that it will over-respond to environmental stimulus. 
Um, and so it's important to understand there's balance there. We need hygiene, and I think, I think what the, the lesson is we can see that hygiene played a major role in the reduction of infectious disease, but I think when we add all these chemicals uh, into the life of humans, we see this massive increased trajectory toward the development of autoimmune disease. And if you look at, uh, at, at some of these additions that I've, I've added into this graph, you can see the wide use of antibiotics begins you know, in the early 1940s. And then you get the vaccine liability removed in 1986, and we see, you know, at that point, a massive trajectory. We could also put in this time plot that in the uh, in the 90s, the widespread use of, of glyphosate as an insecticide um, with GMO crops was, has also been introduced. And so we we can look at also the 3,000 chemicals that have been approved in food also happened within this time frame. And so you, it's not, again, it's not one thing, but it's a multitude of factors environmentally that have weakened us to the level that our immune systems can no longer recognize who we are from the environment. And so we have, again, this mass increase. And one of the other things I'll point out, with, especially with asthma, is the cesarean uh, delivery increases from 20 to 33 percent by 2011, while vaccine schedule increases sevenfold from 1983 to 2016. That's a huge, uh, a huge bump uh, on both accounts. And you can see chemical use in the U.S. reaches more than 30,000 by 1980. So, you know, when you're thinking about you know, whether or not you should buy organic food or whether or not you should opt for natural delivery or whether or not you're, you're going to take your kids into the pediatrician and get them pumped full of, um, you know, I think today's schedule is somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 54 shots by the time they're 18. Now think about that, 54 shots. And you're doing that in the name of protecting them, but, but you're not, nobody's allowed to question whether or not there's an issue and the CDC and the FDA have not adequately studied the safety of any of those things. Admittedly, Bobby Kennedy, the senator, um, sued the government to produce the research because when in 1986, when the U.S. government took over liability of vaccines, they were also supposed to take over research studies to prove the safety and efficacy of these very shots. And when when the Children's Health Defense sued the government to provide the data that they had done the research that proved safety and efficacy, they had they didn't have any data to give him. Um, you know that was published a couple of years ago. You can go back and you can look at that. But I think it's important to understand those things because those are all part of what our culture believes to be normal and true, and that if you don't do that, you're somehow considered the crazy one. Okay, let's talk a little bit about infectious diseases. There are a number of different types of abnormal bacteria and viruses and other uh, microorganisms that we know have autoimmune disease links. And you can see viruses, bacteria, and other infectious pathogens are thought to play a major role in the development of autoimmune disease. Um, and so these are just examples that I've listed on this particular slide where you can see here, you know, Kozaki virus, for example, can cause myocarditis. Streptococcus can cause heart inflammation, trypanosoma cruzi can cause cardiomyopathy, Borrelia burgdorferi can cause arthritis and myelitis, et cetera. So you get the point, and then different infectious microorganisms are related to or associated with different types of uh, developments of different types of forms of autoimmunity. This is a diagram coming from um, a research paper published in 2012. So this is not brand new information. You can see again many of those microorganisms and their association with different forms of autoimmune disease. I'm not going to read that slide to you. And we have things like mycotoxins, and mycotoxins are the chemical compounds produced by environmental molds. Mycotoxins also can be found in, in a number of different foods. Uh, as well. And then probably the, the most common source of mycotoxins in foods is grain. So people who eat heavy grain are also exposed to heavy levels of mycotoxins. Um, peanuts are another common source. Coffee can be, uh, if it's not, you know, if it's not properly tested and vetted for them, it can be. Uh, but you can see the pro-inflammatory effects of environmentally relevant doses of aflatoxin B1 on, on CNS-derived cells could potentially explain immune dysregulation and neurodegenerative disorders. So again, this is the association between aflatoxin and nerve disease. You see another study here on the um, environmentally relevant levels of aflatoxin B1 dysregulates human dendritic cells. These are, these are immune cells. 
And so um, our novel findings open a new door to understand the molecular mechanisms and functional consequences in inducing immune dysregulation, immunotoxicity, and thus non-infectious disease in humans. Okay, let's talk about medical interventions. I said earlier that medical disease, medical error, if you will, or you know, doctors doing what doctors do is the third leading cause of death. Um, you can see here 251,000 deaths annually, and this is U.S. data. This was published in the in the BMJ uh, a number of years ago. And, um, and other studies have, have corroborated, you know, this thought as well. But you can see, as I said earlier, heart disease, cancer, and then medical error being a third leading cause. It's a scary thought when you think about how we treat the first two. Um, look at this diagram on painkillers. If you look at, at the prescribing of painkillers and the number of deaths, the correlation curves uh, match quite well and of course we know one of the largest actually the largest fine ever delivered uh, for criminal activity among drug promotion was given recently to the drug uh, to the pharma company Purdue for lying about OxyContin it's uh, it's painkiller and addicting you know thousands and thousands of American citizens and, and ruining lives and destroying families as a result of these addictions and deaths um, and then you have drugs that can cause gut dysfunction. And so this diagram is just, you know, listing, you know, some of the more common things that we know. Um, because when you affect gut function, you affect nutrition, you affect the host. Um, if, if the host becomes malnourished as a result of gut, uh, gut changes, then, you know, how are, they, how are they positioning themselves for great health? So you can see here, um, pain and anti-inflammatory medications can cause... Um, folate and iron deficiency and, and vitamin C deficiency, which leads to periodontal disease or gum disease, gum bleeding. Um, a number of drugs can affect, um, can affect how well you make and produce your saliva, um, including you know, drugs that block histamine and antihistamines as well as any, any acid medications. You've got drugs that affect the liver because the liver has to basically process the medication. Um, so a you know, classic example there would be would be statins. And remember, the liver is part of your gut, right? It's an accessory organ that helps make bile, and bile is what allows you to absorb fat-soluble vitamins. Um, so again, I'm not going to read all of this to you. You can copy this slide, and you can do with it what you would like, but I want you to understand that it's very well established that medicines can induce vitamin and mineral deficiencies. It's very well established that medicines can do that through many mechanisms, one being damage to the gut, others being the biochemistry. And so that's what I'm showing you here on this slide. Um, you know, there have been text, medical textbooks have been written on the subject of drug-induced nutritional deficiencies. Now, I'd like to poll you guys again. How many of you have ever had a doctor sit down with you and say, I'm going to prescribe this medicine, and by the way, this medicine causes this vitamin deficiency or this mineral deficiency, and so I'm, I want to monitor that vitamin or mineral as long as you're on that medication to make sure that we're not creating a nutritional problem while we're medicating you. Chime in if that's ever happened. I, I bet I won't get a single comment um, below on, on, that, on that particular question because it's just such, uh, it's such an area that's, that's missed. It's such an area that's ignored in medicine today is that drugs oftentimes have a consequence and that consequence is vitamin and mineral deficiency. These are some examples here. Steroids deplete calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, and vitamin C. This includes the asthma inhalers. This includes the oral steroids for pain and inflammation. Those of you with chronic fatigue, if you're taking you know, low doses of steroid, like the two and a half milligram doses, low dose steroid to keep your energy up, this is, you, you need to be aware of this. Steroid side effects long-term cause diabetes and cause uh, elevations in blood pressure and blood sugar. non anti-inflammatories deplete vitamin C, iron, and folate. Um, if you look at this diagram, there's some, some more common examples. Blood pressure medicines block B vitamins, block certain minerals, inhibit CoQ10. A lot of drugs inhibit CoQ10, which is necessary to make energy. Uh, you know, and we, we live in what I would call a pandemic of fatigue. People can't think straight. They have brain fog. They don't have the energy to exercise uh, or to function. And, and, you know, if we look at how many of these individuals are on multiple, multiple medications that have in, in, induction effects on nutritional, um, on nutrition, 
then um, you know we could correlate that pretty strongly. Okay, damage caused by drugs that treat autoimmunity. So like, here's something else that you should be aware of. So um, in this particular study, what's known as DILI or DILI, drug-induced liver injury uh, is, is a common feature of multiple sclerosis drugs. So you've got a diagnosis. It's an autoimmune diagnosis. The doctor wants to put you on medicine to treat it. That medicine causes liver injury, liver damage. Um, you know, so you got to be aware of those kinds of things. Medicines don't come without a cost. Again, you're, you're trading your symptom management for your, your future longevity and your quality of life. And this is not the only example. We've got lots of examples here. These are TNF factor alpha inhibitors. These are, uh, these are drugs that are commonly used rheumatologically to suppress, you know, drugs like rheumatoid arthritis you can see here. TNFI inhibitors was associated with nearly a two-fold increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That's cancer, folks. Our findings support the FDA black box warning for um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So, I mean, if you're if you're struggling aggressively with you know with a rheumatological painful disease, and you're on any of these particular medications, you know you're trading the pain for the risk of cancer. I mean, that, you, you, you know, again, you should be very well aware of that. Um, and if nobody's told you that, maybe this is the first time you're hearing it. Hopefully it helps you make a better decision. You see here, medicines can also cause autoimmune diseases. In the case of aromatase inhibitors, these are the, the, the class of drugs that are commonly used to treat women post-breast cancer. So they, they, they've had a breast cancer, you know, maybe they've had a breast reduction surgery, um, or a mastectomy, maybe they've had um, you know, some chemo and radiation therapies done as well, but then the doctor wants you to take this type of medicine for five years uh, after the cancer treatment. And you can see in conclusion, oncologists should be aware of the potential development of autoimmune reactions in breast cancer patients treated with aromatase inhibitors. Again, these drugs have the ability to cause uh, autoimmune disease, um, lupus to be specific. And lupus, you know, lupus is deadly. Lupus can also kill you. And then here's another, um, you can see this diagram comes from uh, a research study, a research um, comprehensive review on drugs that induce lupus. So this, if you look at this diagram here, um, definite on the left-hand side, drugs that definitely we know absolutely can cause lupus, right? So there's a number of different medications there, many of which are antibiotics. You can see that probable is uh, in the middle there, um, sulfasalazine, antithyroid medicines, anticonvulsants, statins. How many of you, you know, are taking statins to lower your cholesterol? Um, and then if you go to the, the next row, it's the possible relationship. So again, antibiotics, non anti-inflammatories, and blood pressure medicines. And then um, case reports. So these are examples where medicines in, in case reports report, report, or, um, reported in the medical literature were responsible for inducing lupus. So it's a lot of drugs. It's a lot of lupus. Um, you can see here drug-induced lupus, including anti-tumor necrosis factor and interferon induced. Um, you know, the, the summary here is drug-induced lupus is defined as a syndrome with clinical and serological features similar to systemic lupus that is temporarily related to continuous drug exposure and which resolves after discontinuation of the drug. More than 90 drugs, including biological modulators such as tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors and interferons have been identified as likely culprits. Now, the reason I use this slide and show you this is because many of you have an autoimmune arthritis or lupus already, and the doctor is trying to put you on um, anti-tumor necrosis factor drugs or interferon drugs because that's the treatment in many cases for lupus. That very drug that is being used to treat lupus in many cases can actually induce lupus. So at what point, at, at what point does the drug induction of the disease you know, surpass any benefit that the drug may have for control or modulation of symptoms? And then you can see here, I, you know, these are some of my favorite uh, findings, because this is a relatively new finding in medical literature, but um, sprue-like enteropathy, which basically is saying like disease that mimics celiac disease, right? So it's enteropathy, sprue-like enteropathy means villous atrophy. So it's what happens in patients that are taking drugs that are angiotensin receptor blockers. These are medicines that treat high blood pressure. 
Um, these very drugs can cause villus atrophy that looks just like celiac disease. And so, you know, gluten can, can cause villus atrophy, but so can drugs like Omasartan. Um, if, if your drug, if you're on a blood pressure medicine that ends in A-R-T-A-N, Artin, talk to your doctor about this um, because there's been over 100, I think I, to date, the last time I checked, it's like 138 um, studies and case reports of these classes of medications inducing celiac-like disease in patients. You see here the Telmasartan did the same thing, Telmasartan associated sprue-like enteropathy. Um, and then we get, you know, other medical, in, you know, interventions like breast implantation. Um, breast implants are associated in a proportion of patients with complaints such as fatigue, cognitive impairment, arthralgias, myalgias, joint pain, muscle pain, um, pyrexia, which is fever, um, dries and dry mouth. Silicones can, mitig or can migrate from the implant through the body and can induce a chronic inflammatory process. So this is, you know, what, what some refer to as breast implant illness. Uh, and many women struggle with this, you know, the, you know, the vanity of the, of the country that we live in. So many women in their youth and, and, and poor education and naivety run off to, you know, to, to do that type of surgery and have no idea 5, 10, 15 years later that those very implants may be part of their illness as they, as they develop it. And very few doctors talk about this. You can see here undifferentiated connective tissue disease um, and people exposed to severe adjuvants, uh, or not severe, but several adjuvants, vaccines, metal implants, proximity, proximity to metal factories and foundries. And, and so, you know, what are, what are adjuvants, you know, in, in, in a lot of the, the jabs are, are mercury, aluminum is a common one that's used and then you can get metals from other places as well from the environment as well but again undifferentiated connective tissue disease is a form of autoimmune disease as well as fibromyalgia have been linked to the exposure to these things you see that term there where it says major major asia triggers what does asia stand for asia stands for autoimmune syndrome induced by adjuvants you know so when 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 you're going in and they're telling you you should get this shot or that shot, um, you know, ask the question, what are my risks? Oh, there's no risks. Well, Asia is a risk. Autoimmune disease is a risk. I'm treating right now several people who have had, um, had shots, um, developed autoimmunity, uh, you know, joint, joint autoimmunity. I've got several with rheumatoid and, and others with lupus, among other um, different types of rheumatological autoimmunities. You see typical features of Asia, uh, general weakness, chronic fatigue, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so again, there is a risk and there is a potential for damage and you need to know about it so that you can make the right decision. Okay, I'm going to pause here. You've got a lot to think about. I'd like you to go back, re maybe rewatch this and review it, and then we'll pick back up with part three next week and your questions as well. Today I thought I'd share lunch with you guys. Um, it's one of the big questions we get, Dr. Osborne, what do you eat? Um, so this is an example of, of, uh, of a lunch for me. This is a beef stew, and, and um, you know what we've got in this it's a real simple recipe. We take uh, a pressure cooker like an Instapot, and we put in stew meat. So this would be grass-fed, grass-finished beef, a good pound of that with uh, chopped up several potatoes. Now, in this particular recipe, we've got uh, just regular organic white potatoes. Uh, but you would also does a really good job because some of you are nightshade sensitive and um, and and are avoiding potatoes would be sweet potatoes especially the Japanese or the henna variety sweet potatoes they make a really really good beef stew um, also in this is carrots just chopped up carrots um, again grass-fed bone broth and then uh, stew meat this is again grass-fed stew meat so mix that all together and then if you want it thicker, if you like a really thick, if you want it watery, don't do anything new, just add your salt and eat it. But if you want it super thick, you can add, uh, what my wife does is adds arrowroot to it just a little bit to thicken it up. And that gives it that nice 
uh, thick texture or consistency again um, I could take it or leave it my wife tends to like it so what she likes I eat and here we go delicious every time so super easy to make you can make a, a pot of this in under an hour and what we typically do we put it in these little mason jars and we store about eight of them at a time when we make a big batch and we store those in the fridge so you know generally at the beginning of the week I'm gonna I know if she's making beef stew I'm having beef stew for lunch every day you know um, diversity is not necessary in your diet to the degree that um, that you change it up somewhat regularly but again we meal plan to make it easy going gluten-free sometimes can be a challenge the time to cook every day for many of you is a challenge this is a great way to get a solid hot home cooked meal not wrapped in plastic um, on your doorstep or, or you know for your lunch dinner breakfast I can eat it for any of those um, on a consistent regular basis so enjoy Uh, I've got to say the future. I don't know what year because uh, I think if I had options, like I could get, you know, maybe 50 years, 100 years, 150 years, maybe 1,000 years. Um, I'd love to see space exploration. That really is the time I would really like to see uh, if I were going to choose to time travel just simply because um, it fascinates me. There's just so many other um there's just so much of a universe out there that's so much bigger and broader than the Earth that, um, you know, the potential possibility to visit those places to me just sounds like an amazing endeavor. So you have to be in the future where there would be space travel. What year that's going to happen, uh, I can't predict. But with the advent of AI and, and uh, some of the newer technologies and as they're advancing, I don't think we're too far off, you know, from, from beginning that process. Thanks for tuning in to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe for more content like this. And make sure you come back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time and Thursday at noon 30 for more episodes.